I'm Linda Drauswitz. I'm a fourth year medical student at Mayo Medical School. And I'm Michael Bostwick. I'm a professor of psychiatry at Mayo Medical School and I am Linda's co-author on this paper. We're here to discuss our paper, Psychiatric Adverse Effects of Pediatric Corticosteroid Use, which is going to be published in the proceedings. So Linda, what are the important points that you learned from all of your digging? We did a lot of digging. So this is a systematic review of quite a number of articles. The results basically fell into three different categories. The first category was corticosteroids used in neonates or even prenatally and the long-term effects of those drugs. Based on all of the papers we found, there is no agreement on a definitive effect in the long term of the corticosteroids, negative or positive really. What we do know is that neonates treated with the drugs are sick and so we wouldn't say not to treat with the drugs. There was some evidence for a possible difference in negative sequelae between different types of corticosteroids, so betamethasone versus dexamethasone, so we would recommend further studies looking into those differences which may shed light onto some important data that could guide practice. The second category was corticosteroids used in pediatric patients with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So uh, prednisone or dexamethasone can be used as part of those chemotherapy protocols. And we did find that use of the corticosteroids was associated with negative behavioral sequelae in the immediate term. Um, and so it would be important to warn families about those effects. That We're not going to be taking the drugs out of the chemotherapy regimens. They're an important part of it. But when families were asked about um, kind of the quality of life during treatment for the cancers, they said that the behavioral effects of the steroids really negatively impacted their quality of life. Warning them ahead of time that these effects might happen could prompt them to call their physician to actually get some help if there are problems and there are treatments for these issues. And the last category was just kind of miscellaneous, the rest of pediatric patients treated with corticosteroids for diseases ranging from Crohn's disease to asthma to nephrotic syndrome, really the whole gamut across medicine. Um, we use these drugs for all sorts of things. And again, the drugs were associated with negative psychiatric effects. These could range from lability to just a bad mood to full-blown psychosis um, immediately after giving the drug. Um, so what do you do about this? These drugs are a double-edged sword. They're incredibly useful. We're certainly not recommending stopping use of corticosteroids. But what we did find is there are ways to treat these issues. So you can use things like antipsychotics, benzodiazepines. There's no unified um, opinion of which drug to use. But the point is that if we educate families that these behavioral effects can happen from corticosteroids, they might call their physician and actually get some help. Um, education is kind of the the final goal of this paper. Um, so we think that that could help guide practice if physicians are warning families ahead of time that these things might happen. It would also take away the shame and the stigma associated with calling the physician to say, I think my child might be having a psychological issue. Now is it fair to say that one of the things we discovered was that a lot of papers made no mention of counseling families and um, seemed uh, almost surprised to report these effects that, at least in the adult literature, are well known to occur. Yeah, so it, it was astounding the number of papers, not only that didn't mention counseling families, very few to none did, um, but the number of papers that didn't even mention behavioral effects. So we, we looked at some large papers and large studies looking at hundreds to thousands of children treated with corticosteroids. There was one French database in particular that looked at huge numbers of children um, and sometimes there's just no mention of tracking behavioral sequelae. So if the way they were tracking corticosteroid effects was to look at cortisol levels and height, so if growth was impacted, um, looking at adrenal function, and they weren't monitoring for behavior, then there was no way to know if anything happened, especially if the behaviors were within the realm of normal childhood behavior. So if your child is psychotic, you're going to notice that there's something wrong, maybe, unless you don't notice and you just think the child is being strange. But if the child is, let's say, throwing more tantrums than usual, but tantrums are normal childhood behavior, you might not report that to your doctor. In fact, I think most people would feel silly reporting that to their doctor unless they're warned ahead of time that these things might happen. Well, it also introduces another issue, which is that um, since in many cases the questions were not systematically asked about the behavior, it probably was underreported because when it rose to the level of being reported, it had to be pretty egregious. Is that fair? Yeah, I think it's fair to say that. 
Now, you mentioned um, in your introduction that this was a systematic review. Right. Um, I'd, I'd be curious if, it, my sense is actually it's everything but because there wasn't the data to do it. Can you say something about that? Yeah, so with the systematic review, basically our intent originally was to do a regular review and then in looking at all these articles we saw how kind of ununiform and ununified everything was. There were different definitions of behavioral effects versus psychosis versus side effects different uh, corticosteroids being used, different doses. A lot of times the weight of the child was not reported, so we couldn't really get a dose per weight to make any sort of kind of uniform look at what was going on. But we looked at kind of the criteria for systematic reviews, and based on the advice given by the, the gurus of systematic reviews, they said that just because you don't have great data means doesn't mean you shouldn't review it systematically. So we did our best with the data we had this is by no means a clean and tidy and wonderful systematic review, but based on the criteria we set, it is a systematic review nonetheless. Well, I would argue that it probably is a tidy systematic review, but the data you worked with was not, or we worked with was not particularly tidy. Is that fair? Better to say that, yes. And in terms of limitations of the, of the findings, what does that mean? So we basically set limitations first based on the year of publication. So the last review was done in 2005. And so we started with articles from 2006 to the present. Um, basically any articles that mentioned corticosteroid use and any sort of behavioral or psychiatric side effects were reviewed. Um, so practically nothing was excluded except based on being published too early or if the people were outside the age range or things like that. There were very few limitations. I think it's important to mention that the three categories, the neonates, the children with leukemia and the other conditions were our effort to sort of organize these papers and they kind of fell into those three important areas, two important areas in one sort of grab bag category. Right. But I was actually um, thinking about also the limitations for the, the reader of how to apply this information. What can they do with it? What should they not do with it, the data? Right, so this is an article aimed mainly at pediatricians um, versus child psychiatrists. So pediatricians, you are in the trenches working with these children, neonates through 18 to 20 these days, um, who may have all of these ranges of conditions. And so what can you take from it? Talk to the families. If you are about to prescribe a corticosteroid in any way, or if you know a family who, for instance, just had a child and they were treated prenatally with corticosteroids, talk to them about this data and about the fact that there could be effects. We can't definitively say this will happen, that will happen, but just bringing it up really reduces the stigma and just opens up the, the conversation so that they might feel comfortable calling you if there's an issue. Well, often the it, it also may open up the possibility that uh, if a problem emerges that the reason for it could be understood and, and further efforts to try to understand the problem could be made. Right. Um, and then the other point of the paper, A, the first point being to educate pediatricians and to kind of help disseminate this information to families via the pediatricians. The second point is to prompt further, better studies and maybe a unification of definitions. There's, th these are good studies that have been done and our goal was not to say these, these studies are bad. The goal is to kind of unify the direction so that future studies can be compared more easily and that through collaboration we can find some actual answers and some actual trends in what's going on here. So it seems that a very important finding was that it's a bit like uh, Babel, all these different papers are speaking to each other in multiple different languages, right. and while there are similarities, drawing any definitive conclusions is hard, other than in fact this sort of psychosocial point that warning parents that these are uh, uh, tough drugs that can have side effects that we can't help but uh, we can't manage if they occur is an important thing to do. Right. We hope you found this presentation from the content of Mayo Clinic Proceedings valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our home page is www.mayocliniceproceedings.org. There you will find access information for our social media content such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.com. 
This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.